So this raises an interesting point here uh, as in terms of uh, our genet is genetics destiny. Mother had breast cancer at 82, someone is 75, does that mean she's going to get it eventually? Um, well, to, several points there. Um, uh, is that uh, actually four or five points popped in my head there when I said several, <laughs> but I'll just cover the top of this. First of all, breast cancer is common, and most breast cancers occur in people who don't have a genetic susceptibility to it. They don't have that BRCA1, they don't have that BRCA2, or a few other abnormal genes that you can inherit uh, that give you a susceptibility. Most breast cancers you don't inherit, and it's, and it's, and it's common. Somebody who lives to 80, uh, 85 or so really has cumulative incidence of 10% or more of getting breast cancer mm -hmm. sometime in our life, so it's a pretty pretty common phenomenon. Uh, two is that the, if you are carrying a susceptibility gene, the odds are if you're going to get breast cancer, it's going to be early. So we look for early onset breast cancers to identify high-risk families, people with breast cancer in their 30s or 40s, uh, or even younger sometimes. Are, that, that's, that's, that's a sign that there may be breast cancer uh, susceptibility in that particular family. The third point I want to make um, uh, is that even if you're carrying an abnormal gene that really has a high chance of, of leading to breast cancer, like BRCA1 or BRCA2, there's no guarantee that you're going to get it. Um, is that we're still talking about odds, and, and there's still things that you might want to do to lower your odds. For example, we've learned that, that, that young women who are carrying an abnormal BRCA1, if they're athletes and they exercise, they, 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 they delay the time that they get their breast cancer. They still may get breast cancer, but they get, but, but they get it later. And it shows that even the highest risk individuals not being fat, fat tissue we're learning by research, um, uh, you know, and, and a lot of it's going on here and at Cornell, Andy Dannenberg, Clifford Huddas here at Memorial are leading some very important studies uh, that are showing that fat actually, you can actually look in fat tissue and see abnormal cells uh, that show that there's, in, there's activity Remember I said that inflammation or immune system stimulation may actually promote the growth of cancers. We can see evidence of that, and fat actually stimulates uh, the inflammatory changes that, that, uh, that, that, that may cause cancer. And so you don't want to be fat. You do want to exercise. You don't want to consume too much alcohol, which is another, an, 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 another factor. Um, and um, uh, there is some evidence, by the way, that smoking cigarettes actually increase breast cancer. I don't think there's good evidence, but certainly lung cancer occurs in that situation. But generally, taking good care of yourself, avoiding too much estrogen. Um, uh, this is something that, 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 that we have to identify. A lot of women have been taking estrogen automatically uh, when they reach menopause to try to keep them in a premenopausal state, because somehow that's going to increase their health. Well, actually, we learned by studies that, were, that, that became public in 2002 is that hormone replacement therapy in your postmenopausal years dramatically increases your chance of getting breast cancer. It also increases heart cancer, it also, heart disease, it also increases stroke, uh, and does a lot of other bad things to you as well. And so that's, that we've seen a dramatic decrease in the use of postmenopausal hormone replacement. I think it should reduce to zero, in fact, uh, because we have other ways of dealing with things like vaginal dryness and bone density that don't give you a higher incidence of breast cancer. But, but taking too much estrogen, uh, birth control pills, we're not totally sure, but I still think it's a good idea to avoid them because we're not sure. And, um, and, 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 and that certainly could be, could be a factor as well. And there is some evidence, not as strong, but some evidence that, that, that it might as well. So even if you fall into a high-risk group, there's no guarantee you're going to get breast cancer. And you can do things to lower your odds of getting breast cancer in any given year. So no, no genetics is um, a warning sign, but it's not necessarily your absolute destiny. And speaking of genetics, there's a few questions here that kind of touch um, uh, on the idea of if you have a strong family history, if you are BR, BRCA1 or 2 positive, what about prophylactic mastectomy? Yeah. Well, the definitive way. Actually, we should say, make sure that right. everybody understands right. what that means. Yeah, what what that, that right, means. we'll talk about, we, we talk, we talk about we, the phrase we use is risk reducing surgery. And that is if you're carrying a gene, uh, that pre an abnormal gene that clearly predisposes you to breast or ovarian cancer, and usually there's, there's a history of breast and or ovarian cancer in the, in the, in the family. Many people want to go to the ultimate at preventing getting breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And the ultimate is to remove the organs where the cancer could occur. So bilateral mastectomy is removal of the breast tissue, and with just the breast tissue, not the lymph nodes under the arm. Uh, and uh, usually, almost always now, we do immediate reconstruction at the same time so that when you wake up, you wake up with with breast mounds that then are worked on and, and perfected so that, uh, so that they have the appearance of breasts. They don't feel like breasts to you. They don't have breast sensation, but they do have breast appearance. 
uh, and removing the ovaries. We like to see the ovaries removed in anybody carrying one of these abnormal genes by age 45. Some people like to do it earlier um, uh, in that setting. And uh, we actually find a significant incidence in the range of about 1% of normal ovaries that come out in those individuals actually have little tiny ovarian cancers in them, which was not suspected. And those are very grateful people because they're cured now and don't develop those ovarian cancers. So that actually can be done. But, but you know, that's not the kind of thing you discuss in a big auditorium. That's the kind of thing you discuss with a really skilled clinical geneticist uh, who can balance all the, all the risks and benefits in the context of your individual life so you can make a very informed decision about this. Uh, there's no one right decision for everybody. You've got to make a decision that's right for you. We have a couple of questions here about diet. Um, right. And uh, someone who mentioned uh, perhaps hormones in dairy products. Uh, yeah. Are there things that you can eat that may reduce your risk yeah. and other things that you can eat yeah. that may increase your risk? <coughs> Sugar, hormone, uh, not hormones, but dairy right. products, right. other things. Yeah, this, it, that's always a very common. The one thing we know for sure is you don't want to be fat. All right, that's, that's, that, that we know for sure. So whatever you know, it we, takes to There can be questions about fat in the diet, but there's no question about fat in your body. It's not a good idea. Of that, there's no question. Uh, the way you get fat is you take in more calories than you use. Uh, so the solution is take in fewer calories and exercise more so you burn off, you burn off uh, those calories more. And that is just so good for you, it is, uh, you cannot emphasize that enough. We're not just talking about cancer, we're talking about heart disease, we're talking about stroke. Mm -hmm. We're also talking about mental function, people who exercise and, 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 uh, and, and take care of themselves in general. Think better, they have a lower instance of the degenerative changes that may occur with normal aging of the brain. Uh, it is extremely important to do that. However, what you eat has, a, has, has an impact, all right? And, and, uh, and if you eat the way your body was constructed to eat, which is uh, mostly plants, fruits and vegetables, vegetables more important than fruits, uh, not very much animal sourced foods, uh, you know, and that includes things like dairy products and, and, and things like um, uh, meat, you know, especially, especially the kind of fatty meat. I mean, the kind, uh, a, a modern cow is not what a cow was like when cows were just cows, when they didn't have to worry about being eaten. Uh, it's a very, very different, diff very different kind of animal. Um, uh, in, in that, in that, kind of, that, in that uh, context. But if you're eating mostly, I'm a vegetarian myself, if you want to ask, all right, uh, you know, myself. Uh, the, the milk consumption is, is really very interesting. There actually have been randomized trials, randomized trials in, in, in Asia that actually do show that there's a negative impact of milk consumption uh, on health uh, that may not have anything to do with hormones in milk. But we do find hormones in, in milk because hormones are given to cows to, so to enable them to keep making milk even when they are, you know, they're not in the immediate postpartum situation. As you know, for those of you who had children, your breasts you know, start to make milk after you give birth to your child, and then they'll continue making milk as long as you breastfeed, so that as long as the baby is, is breastfeeding. And so the same thing with cows, and you gotta keep that going, but you could actually increase the production by giving them certain hormones, and that does get in the milk. How dangerous this is, I don't know. I honestly don't know, but I think it's a good idea to try to avoid that. Uh, I had um, one person that I knew who was a very, very big milk drinker um, uh, from Italy, and then she moved to the United States and continued drinking a lot of milk just because she liked it, and she got breast engorgement. And she happened to be a physician, and she knew all about this, so she stopped drinking milk, and her breast got better. So there actually was a biological impact you know, that, that, that occurred. It's an anecdote, but it's kind of a, a very, very compelling anecdote in that situation. Um, you can get calcium from a lot of other, there's a lot of foods that have calcium in it. Uh, moderate milk consumption is probably very, very reasonable. I'm talking about excessive consumption, you know, in, in, uh, as, being, as, as being the major thing. It's not a poison, it's a food, and cheese is great. And uh, moderate consumption is probably very reasonable, but you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to overdo much of anything. But the main source of your intake should be plant-based. Because you know, you look at your teeth. You don't have the teeth of a carnivore. You know, if I if I gave you if I gave you a, a, a real live chicken, you know, you're not going to be able to do to that what a lion could do to that, right? A lion is a carnivore. You give them a live chicken, they're very happy. They know exactly what to do. Uh, you, we don't do that. You know, we have to prepare it special ways because we don't have the teeth. We don't have the digestive system to be able to handle raw raw meat. Um, and and uh, so we have the teeth of basically plant eaters. And so that's what really what you could, should consume mostly. I'm trying to picture a lion chasing a chicken across yeah. the... Uh, yeah. uh, no, I gave the lion the chicken. I, shouldn't, I know I shouldn't have done that, but you know... They, <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about... Um, there are a number of questions here about these estrogen inhibitors, estrogen blockers, right. the uh, aromatase inhibitors, tamoxifen. Is there a consensus now as to how long 
They mm. should be taken after after the uh, surgery. Uh, and also, what's the downside of taking these estrogen blockers? Yeah, there's, there's a, um, uh, it's, it's an emerging field. Not all the trials are in. Uh, we do know certain things for sure, though. With tamoxifen, the, the, the in, in general, if you're just going to use tamoxifen, five years is the most you should use it. Uh, after five years, somewhere between year five and year ten, it actually, can, if, it, if it hasn't killed the cell, it could actually start to stimulate it. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to take it for very long. The cells could become dependent upon it. A uh, very interesting study uh, that, that was done a few years ago has shown that with people who took five years of tamoxifen, if they then were postmenopausal and took five years of an aromatase inhibitor, they actually did better. And those patients were now re-randomized to take another five years. So they have 15 total years of hormone therapy. Mm -hmm. And the data is not in yet uh, in, you know, in that regard. But at least from a theoretical basis, you know, there's every reason to believe that it really might work. Now there's a tendency in postmenopausal patients to start off with the aromatase inhibitors. And there the solid data is five years. And people are asking the question, should they take it longer than five years, you know, you know up, to, up to 10 years? So, and, uh, and there, too, it's, it's, we don't have the evidence to support that at the present time, so you can't say it's evidence-based. However, we know a lot about the aromatase inhibitors in terms of side effects, and the major side effect is bone loss. So that, and that occurs in, in under 10% of patients, 7 8% of patients probably, but it can happen. And so monitoring bone density uh, is a very good idea for people who are on the aromatase inhibitors. The, there too, this really has to be individualized. Don't go home and say, Dr. Norton says do this, and, you know, I'm going to do this. It has to be individualized to your individual situation. So talk to the person who's taking care of you and try to get straight answers you know, from, from that individual in, in, in this regard uh, so that you can make, a, again, the decision that's individualized for your care. Always important, obviously. Right. Um, find something on a mammogram or an MRI. Right. The next step is usually a biopsy. Right. What about needle biopsies versus yeah. open biopsies? Can yeah. you miss cancers with a, yeah. with a needle biopsy? Uh, our, our first approach now in the majority of situations is something called a core needle biopsy. So you remember when you were a kid and you took a straw and you stuck it into a piece of clay and you took it out and then you blew out a core of clay? Who remembers that? Oh, you didn't have a good childhood, those of you. <laughs> um, I feel so sorry for you. It's a fun thing to do. I want you to go out now, go to a toy store, you get clay, and you, go, you buy a straw, and you stick it in, you take it out, and you'll see you get a core of clay that's stuck in the straw. And then you can blow it out, and then you have, then you have, you have that. It's called a core biopsy. Uh, the other kind of biopsy is a needle biopsy, where you just stick a needle in, and you pull it under some pressure, and you suck some cells out. Uh, in fact, the core biopsy gives much more information, and so that's what it was done. Uh, mostly um, if you really want to make a diagnosis suspicious of cancer. There are sometimes you find abnormalities in the breast that you can't get to it very well um, uh, with, uh, with the kind of needle that you use for core. And, and, and it should be guided with a sonogram or an MRI or a mammogram, depending on what sees it best. So you have a guided uh, biopsy, a guided core biopsy mm -hmm. is the best way. There's some situations where you can't get to it and you have to do an open biopsy. And sometimes the core biopsy just doesn't get it and misses it, but you still think it's there. And then you have to do other kinds of of biopsies, um, the most, the, the best other kind is called a needle localization biopsy, where the mammographer or the breast imager puts a needle into the area where the uh, tumor is, and then and then leaves um, usually a wire. Although now the more modern approach is they could put a little tiny weakly radioactive pellet, very weak radioactivity, you know, not enough to cause any damage, into the area uh, of abnormality, and then the surgeon either following the wire, if you do a wire localization, or if you do uh, with that little radioactive bead, cuts, finds the abnormality, identifies it. With a radioactive bead, you can find it because you have a little like, Geiger counter on your finger, and, and you can find it. And cuts that area out, and then you know you really got it. And then you could actually look at it under the microscope and see, and see what it is. Uh, most biopsies should be core biopsies, um, and they shouldn't be the so-called open biopsies. But sometimes you have to have the open biopsy, mm -hmm. and in those cases, that's, that's really what you do. So if you have some microcalcifications and they do a biopsy and they don't find anything, right. does that? Well, you want to find the calcifications. And you know, that's another thing, you too, is the, that you you, if you take something out, you, we, we will often do a mammogram on or a radiograph called a specimen radiograph on what we took out to make sure that we see the same calcium that we saw in the mammogram. Mm. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you were really in the right area. And then you might want to do a mammogram uh, afterward also to make sure that, that the calcium that you saw has been removed by the biopsy. So you really have to be in the hands of experts. And this is one of the, you know, this is one of the areas of greatest 
uh, specialization in radiology really is, is breast imaging because the, the people who do breast imaging, and we have a whole lot of really fantastic ones in our program here, and I can't speak uh, more highly of them. Uh, the people who do breast imaging have to be extremely skilled because they not only have to be able to read the films, they have to know what films to get, and they are the ones who can go in and make a diagnosis very often by looking at those films and doing the right, doing the right test. And the other message there is that microcalcifications don't necessarily mean cancer. Most of the time they don't. Right. Um, and most of the time, uh, well, first of all, when you look at the calcium, calcium deposits on a mammogram, sometimes they're very suspicious of cancer, sometimes they're not suspicious at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the way they're arranged, the size of the mm -hmm. nodules, the number of the nod, uh, uh, the, the size of the, of the specs, specs yeah. and the number of specs, we can use that to, to say suspicious or not. So if you have malcium, calcium deposits on your mammogram and a really good radiologist looks at it and says, these are not suspicious, don't be nervous. Uh, because a really good radiologist can tell if they require biopsy or not. Mm. But if they do require a biopsy, they should be biopsied. So there's lots of things that are benign that form calcium specs. Right. And then there's that precancerous lesion, DCIS, that I mentioned to you earlier. It's important to know about. And occasionally we do find cancers, and sometimes we find them when they're so tiny that the core biopsy takes out the whole cancer. We have to go back then and cut more to make sure that it's all out, but we're finding really little tiny cancers now mm. with, with modern screening techniques. And of course, there the cure rate is extremely high. Great. This is an interesting question because you mentioned about vaccines and, and stimulating the immune system in, uh, in non-specifically right. and so forth. What about other vaccines, flu vaccines or right. taking things like vitamin C that is supposed to uh, help? Well, these, the are very, these are very different, so these right. are very good questions. You know, you should take flu vaccine, you know, every year. I mean, this is good. important because you don't want to get the flu. Um, and that's, and you know, the flu can be really bad. The flu can be lethal, you want to take it. Taking a flu vaccine is not going to give you breast cancer. It's not going to prevent you from getting breast cancer. It's very, vaccines are very specific. Your immune system is very, very specific. And you get a specific flu vaccine, teach your immune system to destroy the viruses that cause that flu that year. That's why you have to have a new flu vaccine every year. So avoiding vaccination for fear of, uh, of causing other diseases is really not founded. It's actually a very dangerous thing to avoid vaccines if you, can, if you, if you should get them. Vitamin C is a whole different story. A vitamin C is a natural thing that we find in oranges and citrus fruits and many other, many other, 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 other fruits and some vegetables. It's a naturally occurring substance. It's extremely important for your health, for a whole variety of, 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 of things. And in fact, if you don't have enough vitamin C, you will get a disease called scurvy. Um, uh, uh, and, and that's a bad disease. I've only seen one case of scurvy in my entire career. Was it a sailor? And that was, well, no, that was, a, that was, it wasn't a sailor. That was, <laughs> that's a, that it used to be that sailors, of course, would just eat meat, basically cured meat uh, for many, many months on the sea, and sometimes even longer than that. And so they had no fruits and vegetables, and therefore they didn't have vitamin C, and they would get scurvy. <clears throat> and it was found out that the British Navy found out that if they put limes on board and they made sure that the sailors ate a lime once in a while, they wouldn't get scurvy, and that's why the British sailors were called limeys. So the, um, uh, you know, from, from you know, in, in that regard. Um, how do I start the story? Oh, I was talking about vitamin C. So the um, lime and gin and tonic <laughs> or something. I think. So the um, uh, the uh, notion is, but you know, the amount of vitamin C you need to prevent scurvy is 15, one five milligrams per day, and the best way to get it is to get it in its natural way with fruits and vegetables. Um, uh, and vitamin C has a whole lot of other biological actions. Uh, why some people thought, a very smart guy, Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was wrong about most things. The things he was right about, he was very right about. And he, and he won Nobel Prize, and he, got, and, two and, and he did two of them, and he got, was, 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 was really uh, quite a remarkable individual. The things he was wrong about, he was very wrong about. And um, uh, why taking massive doses, you know, grams and grams of vitamin C would necessarily be good for you. We've done many studies that have actually shown that it is not good for you in large doses. Uh, excluding cancer-specific studies, um, uh, one of which I was involved in that was designed by Linus Pauling back in the old days, and, and it couldn't have been done more carefully. And it didn't, for the cancer patients, didn't show anything bad or anything good. It was totally a neutral thing. But what worries me about vitamin C is that cancers love them, love vitamin C. Hmm. The same molecules that are necessary for sucking sugar into the cell, and all your cells need sugar, also bring vitamin C into the cell. As a matter of fact, if you have cancer cells and you're trying to grow them in a dish in the laboratory, if you don't give them vitamin C, they're not going to grow. And so I'm a little bit worried about massive doses of vitamin C because, you know, when you, when you, when you, 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 you say your normal cells need vitamin C, well, when you, you feed the cops, you also feed the criminals. Uh, cops and criminals eat exactly the same food. And so, and so feeding cancers vitamin C perhaps be dangerous, and we have to really think about this and worry about it. So I think your best bet is eat food. 
and be sure to eat some food that has a little vitamin C in it, you know, and, um, and, and then you're not going to get scurvy. And, and from everything we know, you're going to be healthy. The only supplement that I think there's any evidence for is vitamin D, as we've already discussed. Back to the original lesson of if a little bit is good, a lot is not necessarily better. And maybe really bad. Maybe, and maybe very right. bad. Uh, I want to thank all of you for Oh, attending. it's over. Uh, it's over. It's <laughs> over. Uh, actually, and thank you. Thank you. I think you have uh, yeah. some... Yeah. Yeah. I think you have some surveys there, or some suggestions. Yeah, there. where it says Larry Norton put down fantastic, okay? okay so and wait a minute, also where it says Max Gomez put down fantastic. Isn't he great? <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you, buddy. That cost me 20 bucks. Um, I know, actually, Dr. Norton has another, has something else he has to go to, so he really has to run. Thank you all for attending, and we'll see you at our next Cancer Smart Lecture coming up in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Thank you guys.